Welcome to Basic Black. Some of you are joining us on our broadcasts and others of you are joining us on our digital platforms. I'm Callie Crossley, host of Under the Radar on 89.7. Tonight, 2022, the year ahead, we, like you, are dealing with the effects of the coronavirus pandemic and are taking precautions. We are working with limited staff and our guests are joining us remotely. The calendar may have flipped, but people of color are facing old problems in this new year. The impact of COVID-19 with its Delta and Omicron variants is still with us. So is the ongoing debate over voting rights and blatant voter suppression. People of color are still suffering the brunt of the pandemic-forced economic downturn, while the police brutality which led to George Floyd's murder continues. And as school systems are under attack for teaching the racial history of the nation, poor communities are devastated by weather events linked to climate change. Political victories by people of color, including Boston's own Mayor Michelle Wu, are a positive contrast to the intensifying political divisiveness. But how will the events of last year factor in the lives of people of color this year? Joining us remotely, Renee Graham, associate editor and opinion columnist for the Boston Globe's op-ed page. Rasan Hall, principal at Rasan Hall Consulting and the former director for the Racial Justice Program at the ACLU of Massachusetts. Philip Martin, senior investigative reporter, GBH News Center for investigative reporting. And Malia Lazu, CEO and founder, the Lazu Group and lecturer at MIT Sloan School of Management. Welcome to all of you. I'm going to start this way, and I don't know if it's possible for you to do this, but I'm going to ask. Is there a way to find a common thread that links all of these very important events that impacted a people of color? So I'm thinking COVID, uh, police brutality, um, the, uh, the educational uh, uh, debates about um, CRT, the voting rights, all of that. As you look back, is there a common thread, Renee, that you could see? I mean, for me, it's clearly racial injustice and white supremacy. You know, that's what's linking all of these issues, whether you're talking about the inequities that have been amplified by COVID. They always existed, but they've become much more apparent to people who weren't paying attention um, during this pandemic. Certainly what's been going on in schools and at universities with the teaching of American history. I don't even like to call it critical race theory because we're talking about American history and that's what people are trying to eliminate. Um, all of these things are linked by this nation's addiction, really, to white supremacy and whatever it takes to sustain it. How would you add to that, Rasan? What we're seeing, and to build off of Renee's point, are what I'd like to see as the death throes of, of white supremacy. It's those last herks and jerks uh, right before it fades out. The, the people showing up in hordes at school committee meetings, um, protesting mask mandates, um, the support for law enforcement, unless law enforcement is trying to stop you from overthrowing the government. Uh, these are the people who have a belief uh, in a certain type of nation. And seeing that fading away uh, provokes this type of violent uh, reaction. And we're seeing it across many sectors. Look at voting rights, the number of restrictive voting laws that have been introduced, the inability for the legislature to pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, mm. uh, speaks volumes about what's trying, what they're trying to preserve in this nation. Philip. I, I agree with both my colleagues. Uh, you, what you also see, the, the, the thread without question is white supremacy and systemic racism. But, but we're also at a crossroads uh, between uh, the, the possible success of the backlash uh, and the ongoing progression of or ongoing uh, fight for civil rights and voting rights in this country and trying to make those things happen. And the crossroads I'm talking about is because we are at a point where some people have accepted authoritarianism in this country uh, as, as their logical conclusion uh, to this country's construction. Uh, it is a way for uh, many of them to, uh, to retain uh, the uh, people like Donald Trump in power and to basically to fight off the ongoing growth of black and brown communities, uh, Asian American, Native American communities in this country. So right now we're at a crossroads between progress and backlash. Uh, and the question of 2022 
uh, is uh, can progress basically succeed in wiping out these nefarious uh, 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 incidents that have occurred over the past year and manifest in, as Renee said, the false uh, assumption around critical race theory, which is really the teaching of American history, and the advancement of voting rights. Will we see those things uh, uh, take shape in 2022? Okay, I just want to be clear that critical race theory is, uh, as it is being debated, is about something nefarious. That's right. Um, but in fact, it is taught in law schools, not in K through 12, and it has uh, devolved into an argument about whether there should be the teaching of racial history of this nation in schools. So just so everybody's clear about that. Mm -hmm. Now over to you, Malia, how would you add to this? You know, I would add by actually bringing in a philosopher and, you know, someone who writes about critical race theory, Charles Mills. And he has this essay that is a great read. Um, it's called The Epistemology of White Ignorance. And he talks about how white ignorance is an ignorance that fights back. It's an ignorance that doesn't want to solve itself. And I think what we're seeing right now because of the 400 years plus of white supremacy um, is that it is it is pushing back, right? When it hears things like critical race theory, when it sees that actually white supremacy is a falsehood, right? Which we've been proving for hundreds of years, um, it, it needs to push back. And, you know, I agree with my panelists that what we're seeing is, um, you know, white supremacy holding on. Uh, you know, it's a part of Americans' DNA. Um, it was how we were created on the backs of um, genocide of, you know, indigenous people and enslaving of Africans. And it's at our cult core who we were. Um, and as demographics change, as generations, um, you know, become more and more open to this idea of equity, I think we're, we're seeing what I like to call social justice clawbacks, right? And, and power structures trying to claw back um, the wins and, and victories that we've had. All right, so now I want to start with some specifics and ask you to look at what happened last year and look forward to this year in terms of the impact on um, communities of color. Malia, I'm going to stay with you because one of the things that you pointed out as we, as folks of color have been really battling the economic downturn worse than others, is that the federal officials are about to wean away the pandemic uh, money, the pandemic support money. And where will that leave us then in 2022? Or rather, where will that leave communities of color? You know, it'll it'll leave us. We we know where it's going to leave us, right, Callie? It's going to leave us with even less we have than, than we have now. I mean, I think it's critically important to remember that our economy is color coded, um, and therefore the people who are the working class um, tend to be more people of color. And you know, th those are folks who rely on the safety nets of this country, and rightly so. They you know they, they help us build this country and get very little of the upside of American capitalism. And so, without getting the continued support. I think, you know, us seeing um, this Build Back Better bill and what happened with that, um, you know, us really seeing that there's going to be a retrenchment of tax dollars and helping working class people um, is going to do nothing but continue to hurt um, Black communities throughout this country. Uh, the uh, job numbers have uh, come out, 200,000 um, added to the rolls. It's much less than was expected. However, these are numbers that do not factor in the Omicron impact. So we can assume that it would be much worse later when we factor all of that in after they figure that all out. Um, and we also know that even if the, uh, the percentage of folks who are back to work are as they are, it's double that for, for black folks. So let me um, talk to you, Renee, about COVID, which is something that you've been, um, which we know is connected to the economic downturn. But you pointed out that you're just even making a decision about having first night go on, you know, is fraught with all kinds of issues. Based on what we know and how folks of color were treated in terms of diagnosis, in terms of access to medication in 2021, what's your prediction for 2022? Sadly, I, I see a lot of, you know, more of the same. I don't know that enough has changed to 
to make things look any different this year than they look in 2021 or they looked in 2020. The same disparities that people saw in 2020 in terms of treatment, access, you know, none of that has changed. You know, we know who's filling these hospitals. At the same time, we also know who the frontline workers look like and what they're enduring and the ways that essentially the Biden administration, a senior official said this week that, no, there won't be another COVID relief package because we don't want to give people incentive to sit at home. Mm. This idea that the government helping its citizens during a pandemic is somehow an unwarranted handout says a lot about this country, which seems to always be able to find money for the defense budget or these things that matter to them, but don't have money for universal child care or the things that will really help people. It's time for them to stop talking about these things and actually do something about them so that they're helping the people who are suffering most. So how much do you think that COVID fatigue will factor in in, uh, in, a, in a way uh, that's detrimental to communities of color? I mean, look, I think people can have all the COVID fatigue they want. They might be tired of COVID, but COVID is clearly not tired of us. So this whole idea that, well, we're tired of us and we're ready to move on is irrelevant. You know, everyone thought, okay, we had Delta and we kind of you know, took those blows, but things were getting better in the early fall. And if you look at some, if you look at Massachusetts, which was getting close to, you know, a thousand cases a day, Massachusetts is now over, well over 20,000 cases a day, and this is a highly vaccinated state. So this idea that we're ready to move on, it, it, it's ridiculous. It makes no sense because we're still in the throes. I'm not even going to say in the middle of this pandemic, because frankly, I don't know where we are at this point. We are still deeply in the throes mm -hmm. of this pandemic, and it's going to decide when it's, when it's done with us. We won't decide when we're done with it. Okay. Um, Philip, you said police reform is going to take a big step back in 2022. Why? Well, well you see it now. I mean, uh, in, if you go back to uh, the demonstrations following the death of George Floyd, those that followed immediately uh, in May of uh, 2020 uh, and uh, the, the months uh, after that, you saw uh, efforts, basically, and legislation, basically, to reform police. Uh, you saw on the table the issue of qualified immunity, uh, something which had been uh, seen as sacrosanct prior to uh, the demonstrations. But what's happening now is uh, here in Massachusetts, for example, with the police reform, uh, qualified immunity is off the table. It's not even being, uh, uh, being discussed in any serious sense. And that is the principal issue. Uh, that uh, uh, people of color should be concerned with in, the, in relationship to police. Uh, even in a state like Minnesota, where um, uh, the modern manifestation of the Black Lives Matter movement, that is to say uh, that uh, which uh, came after the Trayvon Martin uh, uh, demonstration, so on and so forth, uh, even there you've seen a step backward in St. Paul and in Minneapolis in terms of police reform. Police reform bills have basically been largely diluted. Uh, and again, if you don't have qualified immunity on the uh, on the table, uh, then it is absolutely uh, uh, problematic uh, how serious we are about treating police violence in this country. Rosanna, I want you to pick that up, but I would just uh, preface it by saying there were two uh, court cases that could be looked at um, as victories. One, Derek Chauvin was convicted of the murder of George Floyd and uh, Kim Potter most recently uh, was uh, charged with uh, shooting Dante Wright, mistaking, she said, her, her taser for her gun. Uh, but be that as it may, in both cases, folks of color really didn't think that was going to happen. Either of those uh, convictions would happen. So based on that, how do you see what may or may not be happening with either upcoming cases or just following what Philip said, police form in general, reform in general? Those are, those are incremental changes. Uh, it has to do in large part with the shifting of the public narrative around police accountability and this notion that police are beyond reproach. You now have progressive prosecutors and prosecutors more generally 
who are willing to bring charges uh, against police officers where before they would have done an investigation and determined that the officer was justified in the shooting. Now we're seeing more of these cases and the national consciousness around police violence has changed where a jury may be more inclined to believe that an officer's conduct was criminal. That said, that does not overwhelmingly change the landscape of police violence and our reliance on this judicial system to bring about justice. Justice is these black people not being killed to begin with. And so for as much as we appreciate uh, these guilty verdicts as a symbol uh, of some sort of progress, it doesn't get to the underlying issue of the nature of policing and police violence. And it doesn't speak to the potential rise in uh, white vigilantism, uh, particularly after uh, the acquittal of Kyle Rittenhouse, who is now celebrated as a hero on the right. And although he killed uh, white people, uh, it was white people who were standing up in defense of uh, the murder of a black person. And so I think that's something that needs to be contended with, especially when you look at these high priced jury consultants that can help craft a case to help somebody get off in a case like that. All right. So here's an issue that I think has not gotten enough attention, even though it's quite sobering and particularly sobering for folks of color, and that's voting rights. Mm -hmm. um, we're at a point now where uh, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has said he's reintroducing the bill. Uh, the John Lewis bill went nowhere. Um, we're seeing the kind of blatant voter suppression everywhere uh, across the country. Blatant. I mean, they're not even trying to pretend, Renee. Um, so what happens, it's hard for me to even say these words, what happens if uh, neither of, uh, of, of any of the efforts in Congress go through and th there you have it. I, I, I'm just, I can't, I'm, I'm having a hard time actually getting my mind around that. So, so where are we with that? You know, there's been a steady erosion. If you go back to 2013, the Supreme Court decision, um, of voting rights. It's the whole, what's been happening since then is the gutting of voting rights. And so now that there's no need for federal preclearance, states are doing whatever they want to do. You know, and as you said, it's not even subtle. It is blatant. The whole idea is to sort of drop kick voting rights back to the Jim Crow era. Like that's what we're looking at. And you've had people, you know, on the right actually say, well, everyone shouldn't be allowed to vote. That voting is a privilege, it's not a right. Which of course is the exact opposite of the truth. Voting is a right. We are all allowed to vote. But that's not the, the, the trend things are taking. I, I'm certainly disappointed with the Biden administration. You know, he talked a lot about voting rights um, as a candidate and he didn't early in his presidency. And I'm not saying he doesn't have a lot on his plate, but really one of the most important things he has if not the most important thing, is voting. That's everything. You don't get that right, nothing else will matter. And I just don't have a greater sense of the urgency that's necessary to deal with this. I think that the Democrats need to stop playing nice with this and understand what is at stake. And what's at stake is everything. Malia, what would you add to that? Yeah, I mean, uh, an amen and a nod, um, I would first add to it. But I think what Renee brings up is critically important is that we will be, we will go back to Jim Crow and Democrats won't win another race. I mean, mm -hmm. I think it's it's really wild to see how lackadaisical Democrats are at the reduction of our rights, um, considering that Black people are their base and Black women in particular are their base. I, you know, for me, it's been very surprising um, to see how we don't actually have a strategy forward for this voting rights bill. And um, something that's so critical, and as Renee says, that means everything to saving our democracy, right? Once again, Black women will save the day, um, as we did in the last election. And, you know, when we see Stacey Abrams, when we see Latasha Brown, when we see these women who are down, you know, south fighting for our rights to vote. I think it becomes very scary to see the um, ineffectiveness, maybe even, um, you know, fear of, mm -hmm. of pushing this bill. I mean, if you're not going to lose political clout on this, what are you willing to lose political clout on, right? Um, and and I think that's really what 
we need to understand is that if these voting rights don't go through, um, a, a huge swath of, of the Democratic base and of the American citizens and voters will not be able to cast the ballot. And we can, you know, we can no longer say that our elections are free and fair. Um, weigh in, Philip. You have 23 states, Callie, about 23 states that have passed some form of voter restrictions. Uh, uh, Georgia, for example, they have uh, essentially passed legislation where they can take current election officials, people who have been working on their jobs for years, African Americans, white Americans, uh, who have basically uh, uh, Democrats and Republicans, and replacing them with Trump operatives. It's very explicit. You have a situation uh, around the country where these laws are basically uh, uh, in place for 2022 uh, and in 24 to allow uh, essentially a coup to, to take place, uh, if there's no other way of describing it. I think what is about to happen is I think Joe Manchin, who is, of course, the linchpin in whether or not voting rights will succeed or not in this country, will come to some type of compromise. That compromise, however, may be problematic in itself because it may only get us so far in terms of the right to vote. As Renee said, this is a right. This is not a privilege. And the right, and the right to vote itself is under siege, and it's, and it's part of a larger uh, thrust toward authoritarianism to basically rid ourselves of not just democracy, but of a multiracial democracy. We did not have a multiracial democracy during Jim Crow. I mean, and, and we did not have a multiracial democracy uh, during at the start of the civil rights movement. It was only after civil rights legislation uh, was and voting rights was passed in this country, and there's an effort right now, uh, to, and it's happening bit by bit, uh, to to essentially bring us back uh, to a pre of of uh, civil rights era. Um, just for folks who need to be reminded, Joe Manchin is from West Virginia. He's a Democrat. Rasan, please weigh in. I think what is compounded by these regressive voting laws that have been introduced in some of these other states uh, is redistricting. Uh, fortunately, here in Massachusetts, we did a good job. Uh, the Drawing Democracy uh, Coalition that I was a part of, that Malia and I were a part of 10 years ago, helped create more majority-minority districts, and that's a great thing. But in other states, uh, we're seeing legislators intentionally uh, dilute minority voting strength, and that's why you're seeing these lawsuits. And this, again, be is why the Voting Rights Act is so important, because before Shelby v. Holder, the 2013 case that Renee mentioned, uh, was uh, decided by the Supreme Court, certain states had to get pre-clearance or approval before they made any changes to the voting law to determine if it would dilute minority voting strength. And now they don't have to do that. And so they're changing districts, diluting minority uh, voting power. And I say minority because that's the, the legal term uh, for it. Um, and now there has to be litigation in all of these places to challenge it after it's already being introduced. And so it's hard enough to, that we have a hard enough barrier to overcome while people are being prevented from voting. But then when we're put in districts where even if we are able to vote, we can't elect a candidate of our choice, that sets us even further back. You know, Renee, something that's been said among all of you at some point in this conversation is the impact on democracy. And I think people hear that expression and you think, yeah, I kind of sort of know what you mean. But in concrete terms, for folks of color, when we talk about a loss of democracy or a watering down of it, if you will, in this year, certainly, what are we talking about? I think we are talking about things like the decimation of voting rights. I, I, I think what's really difficult for people to understand is that this country can lose its democracy. I heard someone say, yes, I think it was, was Wolf Blitzer actually on CNN, and they were talking about uh, January 6th. And he said, well, that was something we expect to see in third world countries. Mm. And the idea was, well, somehow we're above all that. That could never happen here. It is happening here. And I think it's really impossible for people to wrap their minds around what's happening right in front of them. Not just the insurrection. And this is why when people talk about the insurrection as something that happened, I always say, no, it's happening. Mm. It's still going on. And it's happening in Republican-led legislatures where they're not only making it impossible or for people to vote, but they're going to rig the game on the other side as well. 
So even if you get a chance to vote, you're going, they're going to have people in place to make sure it doesn't matter. The people who count the votes are now going to be in on the game as well. So I think that's the thing. The idea that you have elections and you choose your leaders and that that matters, it's been that way for so long for a lot of Americans, not all Americans, which is part of the problem, that it's, I don't think people understand exactly what's at stake and the urgency with which we need to meet this moment. And can we get rid of the big lie in 2022? I think it's beyond the big lie at this point. Mm. You know, I think the big lie is its own thing, but you know, the big, the, the, you know, America has been a series of big lies. You know, what happened in 2020, the election and what Trump said is just the latest one. You know, if this, if this democracy had been impenetrable, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have gotten Donald Trump. He wouldn't have been in a position to, you know, fire people up into an insurrection at the Capitol last year. It's everything that wasn't done that's sort of coming home to roost now. And it's the way that we've not taken care of this democracy or made it available to everyone is why we're in the position we're in now. Well, I think uh, that's maybe where we need to leave that at the at this because this is the end of our broadcast and the end of our show, but we have more to discuss. So thank you for joining us and now stay with us as we continue our conversation on our digital platforms, Facebook and YouTube. I'm Callie Crossley, host of Under the Radar on 89.7. We're on Facebook and YouTube with our post show, continuing our discussion on 2022, the year ahead. Um, let me jump, because we're talking about politics and democracy. As I mentioned earlier, there was some positive uh, wins in this arena. We saw a number of persons of color win elections and um, including uh, our own Michelle Wu right here in, in Boston. Where do you fit that in the context of the big lie and the concerns about voting rights and democracy, Malia? I mean, I guess it's important to put all of it in context to remember that <clears throat> we've been here, that we have wins in the middle of extreme losses, right? And I, I think, you know, to see the two as equal um, is to maybe compare, you know, or to, to, to see the two together might be um, a, a dichotomy that doesn't serve us, right? I mean, I, I think that we have this social agreement called democracy um, that we were never a part of. And as we fight to become a part of it, um, it fights back, as I was saying er earlier in, in our show. And so what I see um, is a, you know, is a democracy uh, fighting itself and um, people in power, Republicans or Democrats, being bought into the, the idea of democracy more than the people in the democracy. Mm, and, mm. you know, I, I often think of um, the the Martin Luther King quote from Letter of a Birmingham Jail, where he says he fears that the moderates will stop our progress more than the citizens' councils or the Klan because they are more dedicated to order mm -hmm. than they are to justice. And I think what I keep seeing, you know, mm -hmm. in, in all of these stories is that we end up with a democracy that wants to be more dedicated to order than to justice. Mm -hmm. And so we have moderates now deciding, right, um, what, what should our fate be? And that's really, um, really unfortunate that, that that's where we are. I, I also want to say that I think, I, I think we don't fully understand how, how we've been bought into even this idea of American democracy, right? Those third world 
countries that um, Renee was mentioning, Wolf mentioned, we helped create them, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, we we inspired apartheid. We took our, um, you know, we, we were inspired by the caste system of India. And so th this is what makes history so important is for us to understand that we never meant for enslaved people or for indigenous people to have the rights that they've had, right? We never meant for Obama to get elected and for President Obama to be an actual thing. And now that that's happening, um, democracy, white America and uh, is really fighting back because we're finally seeing democracy work for us. You know, it's interesting you mentioned a, a apartheid because uh, in the book Cast, uh, <laughs> there was a piece of history I did not know that in fact the South Africans, the white South Africans were looking around the world for ways in which to implement uh, what they thought would be you know, good racial division. And some of what was happening in America was so abhorrent to them. They said, well, we can't do that. <laughs> we'll, we'll do some other right. stuff, Even but we're not Nazis doing that. Even thought we took it too far, right? It was like, what? <laughs> yeah, so I, I just wanted to add that. Now, before I, I move to somebody else with regard to these, uh, the politics, and positive wins or no, and where they fit in the context. Should we attach meaning to either a win or loss by um, uh, Sandra Chang Diaz and and uh, Stacey Abrams? Yes, I mean, I think we should celebrate our wins, but we should not see anyone win as our liberation, right? Mm -hmm. I, I think that that's where it gets important is to keep everything in context. So, you know, when um, when President Obama won, I was living in Harlem at the time working for Harry Belafonte and I called him and I was like, sir, oh my God, you know, we're free. I'm going down in the streets to party. And, and he laughed and he said, tell me when you feel free, darling. Tell me when you feel free. Um, and, you know, this idea of, for me, you know, I saw the election of Barack Obama as, right, and, and like as this definitive statement. I was young, I was excited, um, and it took the elder to remind me this is one victory and, and we should celebrate it, but we are not there yet and we will have to um, even fight for the victories we have. So, you know, I, I think we should always celebrate joy, you know, there needs to be joy in the fight for justice. Um, but we also need to remember that we need to hold our elected officials accountable when they do win. Mm -hmm. We need to be there, that democracy isn't just about the person in office, but about the backing they have, um, you know, from, from their voting base. And we need to understand that these wins are exactly that wins, but are in no way our liberation. Okay, I want all the rest of you all to talk about uh, the positive political wins and and uh, contextually where you think either a loss or a failure by uh, uh, Sandra Chang Diaz and uh, Stacey Abrams, wh what that would mean. I'll start with you, Philip. Well, I, I think if a, a win by Stacey nice Abrams you, would be uh, extraordinary. Be uh, there are uh, even voices that were perhaps to be more heard significant than a win by Sonia uh, Chang Diaz. Uh, it's well, as Gil Scott Heron Africa. said to me one day in, a, in an interview. It's one thing, you know, like to talk about struggle in, in New York. It's another thing to talk about struggle in Mississippi. This was during the Civil Rights Movement, uh, and of course we're talking about Georgia and Massachusetts. Stacey Steve Abrams right now is against uh, an extraordinary tide in Georgia, where the legislature has basically. Uh, made the legis uh, has made voting of of a, a, essentially a platform for Trumpian politics. Uh, it's made it safe for a Trump voter uh, to elect a Trump official, even if they don't get the votes. Uh, that's how corrupted the system is right now, thanks to the Georgia legislature. And uh, but I think we have to put it uh, as Malia said in context. This is a constant struggle. The struggle between progress and the struggle against backlash. Backlash is 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 extraordinary right now. You have people afraid of losing their privilege, and they're fighting tooth and nail. Uh, uh, in that Trumpian legislatures of uh, people like Lindsey Graham, others to maintain the status quo. So a win by Stacey Abrams would be extraordinary. A win by us uh, by Sonia would be uh, incredible, but not nearly as significant as we would see uh, in, in Georgia, given that backlash. But we have to, again, put it in context. This is static. This, these things are always, uh, there's always this tension between those who want to push us backwards and the notion that we have to go forward. 
uh, uh, in this country if we are to basically defeat what is now a clear threat of authoritarianism. Okay, uh, b uh, before I have you weigh in, Rasan, let me be the 60s cultural dictionary. Gil Scott Heron was a poet <laughs> and musician whose uh, probably most famous work is called The Revolution Will Not Be Televised. Okay, go ahead, Rasan. <laughs> Thanks, yeah, Rasan. Uh, you know, so uh, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote uh, uh, a contemporary poet, uh, J. Cole, uh, who says, there's beauty in the struggle, happiness in the success. And, and I think there's something to be said about whether there is a win or a loss, the, the base building and the power building and organizing that happens in community in support of candidate to build out the political infrastructure and a pipeline so that there are more candidates of color, more progressive candidates uh, that are able to, to run and have a chance of winning. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that I myself am a candidate for Plymouth County District Attorney. And one of the things that I'm trying to do is build out a political infrastructure around Brockton and the rest of the county so that other people of color and progressives can run on solid platforms. And so I think that's one of the things that's really important, despite some of the regression that we've seen uh, across the country, is the mobilization and organizing, base building and power building in communities and communities of color in particular. Um, let me just go back to that. Did you say you are a candidate? Because I heard you were thinking about being a candidate. Are you announcing? And I'm happy for you, too. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm considering being a candidate. I guess I, I spoke a little quickly, but I am considering being a candidate uh, for Plymouth County District Attorney. And so one of the things that I've been thinking about is how to build out this political infrastructure. OK. All right, Renee. You know, I, I keep thinking about what Phil said, but we know how this country works. You know, an, an ounce of progress is always met with a pound of backlash. So while it would be fantastic and historic for Stacey Abrams to win in Georgia and Sonia Chang Diaz to win in Massachusetts, that's not the end of it. You know, it's just like in the same way that a conviction for Derek Chauvin did not mean the end of police brutality and police lawlessness. You know, the, the work always goes on. I think it's great, you know, and it's horrible. As I get older, I'm getting less and less optimistic, which is kind of sad, but I think it's great when you sort of celebrate the wins, but we know that there's always going to be a severe pushback to that. And what would that look like? You know, if after everything they're doing in Georgia, Stacey Abrams still manages to clearly win the governor's seat, what will the backlash be to that? What will be the next step that will be taken in state legislatures and not just in Georgia to ensure that this does not cause more Stacey Abrams around the country to start, you know, find their way into state houses. You know, I'm 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 happy that these things are happening. I'm happy that there are people who are still willing to be engaged in politics given the cesspool that it really is. And that there are smart, capable, and compassionate people who want to do this work. But it can't just be on Stacey Abrams. It can't just be on Sonia Chang Diaz or any of these other women or people of color who are running for these offices, we have to back them up. We have to be there too, and not just when it comes time to vote for them. We have to fight as hard for these causes as they are. Um, let me wrap up this conversation with climate change, which is, you know, not going to bring up your optimism, probably, Renee. Um, you know, for so long, folks used the expression climate change and never thought about communities of color. Uh, but now we know there is environmental racism. And also, I think the country as a whole has seen these extraordinary weather events and that, you know, it is really difficult, hard as some may try, to say it is not linked to warming of the earth and to human activity. Where do you think we'll be this year with regard to climate change and communities of color? Um, I'll start with you, Malia, because you're in Hawaii where... You beautiful out there, but at the same time, uh, why you just experienced this crazy flooding uh, about a month or so ago? Absolutely, and you know what we see even here, right, is that the most vulnerable are the indigenous local Hawaiian people, are the people of color, and the military was nowhere in the flood zone, um, but right now is tainting um, the people of Hawaii's water. Um, and so, you know, you you see that, um, again, you see the power structure and who's going to be the most affected. You know, I will get a little optimistic because I think climate change seems to be an issue 
that younger generations are coming together on to fight from Jump Street. And I've been really excited to see the climate change movement, to see how it so from the very beginning included, right? These young people went to brownfields. They went to, um, you know, places that would need environmental justice. And it became this integrated movement um, rather quickly with people, with young people of color, um, you know, and indigenous activists and what have you. And so I'm optimistic about that. Uh, do I think we're going to do a lot in, in 2022? Um, I, I don't think Think so, but I think as younger people continue to get elected and, and continue to gain power, it is going to be an issue that um, that we are going to start seeing some movement on. And so, may the movement just continue to organize itself and build for 2022. And it'll be really interesting to see how the midterms, how climate change, you know, mm -hmm. and climate change voters play into the midterms. But um, I think my optimism is just looking at these young people and knowing soon they will be in charge and, and we can get out of the way. Mm. Philip. Well, when you see um, white communities, largely white communities being destroyed by fires uh, and floods uh, and all types of, of extraordinary weather conditions that seem unprecedented, but people in this country have become more uh, uh, accepting of the of the, that there is climate change. It's no longer debated in the way that it was years ago. Uh, and you also see policies being uh, implemented, policies, for example, of creating uh, cleaner cars, electric cars. But you ask yourself, if you are basically uh, uh, going to have clean energy and you have electric cars, you think about where these, where these stations, these electric stations, these power stations are located. Where are they located? In black and brown communities, a lot of them, adjacent to these black and brown communities. And so while we are focused correctly on climate change, we're not always focused on the, on the even on the, the part about uh, fighting climate change, the, the, uh, the deleterious impact uh, that some of these uh, electric stations uh, right next to black and brown communities will have when they fire those up in order to basically increase the, the supply. Uh, so I think when we think about climate change, we have to start thinking uh, in, in terms of the racial impact, consciously thinking of it, and thinking about where these communities are located, they're impacted even by uh, uh, efforts to reduce uh, uh, the uh, effects of, of uh, inclement uh, weather uh, that is the result of climate change. Rasan? I'm always concerned about uh, the tipping point and not the global tipping point of when the climate crisis has reached a point where we are beyond uh, no return, but the tipping point where economically, because we are a capitalistic society, that there is a profit motive in pursuing green energy. Um, and, and what happens when we reach that point and begin to, as a society, make investments, to Philip's point, the equity that happens around how resources are distributed. We're looking at global crises with uh, water shortages and how that impacts migration throughout the world and how that subsequently uh, impacts disruption in communities and in nation states. And I'm not as optimistic uh, because the people who are in charge have a lot of power and have a lot of financial investment uh, in making sure that the status quo maintains uh, as it is until we reach that financial tipping point uh, for them. Renee. You know, I think like COVID, you know, we, you know, where COVID doesn't discriminate, neither does climate change. However, we're also aware of how disproportionate the impact is in communities of color. So you're not going to solve this problem. You're not going to address this problem in any meaningful way until you start to look very, in a very concentrated way at the impact this is having in communities of color. And then, you know, you could even link the two in terms of asthma in the communities that have high asthma rates. Well, those are some of the same communities that have had high COVID rates because there's already a compromise of respiratory systems there among the people. You know, you have to make these links and you have to look at it seriously. The thing with climate change is, you know, for years and years, people have been talking about this and normally you would just sort of dismiss as some sort of tree hugger. Now these hundred year storms are happening every single year and they're happening in communities where they're shocking people, whether you're seeing the tornadoes that happened in Kentucky or the wildfires that were in Colorado, 
or some of the, the issues we've had here with winters, not today necessarily, but winters that have simply not been as severe as, they, as people have come to accustomed to in, in New England. It's a real issue. Anyone who's denying that is really endangering sort of millions and millions of Americans, and not just Americans, people around the world, because we've seen the floods in Germany. You know, the crisis is here now. It's not this thing that we're talking about happening in 25 or 30 years. It's happening right now. And if they don't address it, we're going to continue to lose people in ways that we shouldn't be. Mm. Before I let you go, I, just a note uh, that uh, Sidney Poitier, um, an actor of some note, um, certainly one respected in our communities and all around the world, died today. Uh, he was quite an inspiration with a body of work that goes on for decades. Um, made quite a splash early on in his career when he was hired for a role in The Lilies of the Field, only black person in that film, and went on from there. Uh, he's been an inspiration and uh, his legacy will continue and is continuing through so many who have uh, followed in his footsteps, though there's still uh, not as much diversity in the Hollywood that where he worked as there should be. So just a moment to acknowledge that he's left us quite a legacy mm -hmm. and a body of work. Yeah, and I thank you all for joining me.